Uh, John has been teaching writing at Utah State University for 12 years and deeply enjoys working with his students. Uh, the author of essays, stories, articles, and now 22 annual Valentine's poems to his wife. <laughs> Angler is currently finishing up a commissioned screenplay and starting on a book about teaching. He and his wife are deeply invested in the lives of their six children, their daughter-in-law, and the approaching completion of a decade-long building and remodel project of their turn-of-the-last-century home. All right, give the floor to John. Thank you, Travis. Good to be with you guys today. Uh, I teach uh, writing classes. Uh, I teach the writing class that every student at Utah State takes, English 2010. In the summer, I taught uh, a class, and I had a student in my class. We'll call him Tom. Tom came into class, and he wanted to write. Uh, the, the course is a course in persuasive research writing, and so those are three emphases of the course. And he came into the class, and he wanted to write a paper about allowing guns on campus. You'd be surprised how many students want to write about gun control in one form or another. And I said, okay, that's okay. Um, some instructors will actually ban topics like that, and I understand why. But I said, okay, well, what are you going to do with that? Well, I, wanna, I want guns on campus. I said, well, Utah State actually does allow guns on campus already. Oh, yeah, well, okay. So I said, well, why are you writing about it then? Because I think it's important. But they already allow it. This is how the course started for Tom. And it's not entirely uncommon uh, for courses to start like this with our students. Here's the question I want, I, let me, I just want to start with that and we'll kind of come back to Tom in a minute, but here, here's the question I want to consider today as we visit. How long does learning last? How long does learning last? What's your gut feel on this? There's some research on this, but what's your gut feel on how long learning lasts? Let's say how long does it take a student to forget 50% of what they've learned in one of your courses? I mean, this might be discouraging to talk about, but the next day, after finals, almost immediately to six months. I hope they go with them lifelong, too. And this is, this is part of the question. This is a difficult thing to measure, is how long does learning last? And there probably needs to be some more research on effective methodology for this research. They've started to do some research on this. Uh, and, and this is what's really discouraging, is because we all spend, and we pour our hearts into our teaching, don't we? And we hope that they care, and that they learn, and they take it with them forever. What do you remember from your days as an undergraduate? Think back for a moment. How much do you remember? Some, for some of you, this might be just five or 10 years. For others of you, maybe 20 or 30 years. What do you remember? I have to confess that when I look at my transcript, uh, there are classes I'm surprised to see on my transcript. <laughs> because I have no memory whatsoever of the entire course. And I wonder sometimes, now that I've been here uh, 12 years, and probably I've uh, taught nearly 100 sections of English 2010, 2,500 students over that time, how many of those students have no recollection whatsoever of my class? And I wonder about that. Let's look a little bit at the research. There were four, there we're going to look at four studies here. Uh, the first study. Oh, before we look at the research, we're going to pull up this cone that, uh, that Dr. Uh, First looked at this morning, the cone of learning. Now, you'll notice, this, this pops around the internet uh, now and again. you notice that the source is Edgar Dale, who she mentioned this morning, 1969, that's a while back. And she was absolutely right that there, uh, Dale did no research in developing this cone. Here's the other thing. Dale actually never put any of these numbers along the right-hand side to his cone. That's all fabrication after the fact by, I'm sure, well-intentioned people. <laughs> Dale created this cone as an intuitive model of learning. 
learning that is less effective leading to learning that is more effective towards the bottom of the cone. So this cone is effective in, and I think it rings true for most of us, it's an effective way to consider active versus passive learning, but I think we can kind of discount the numbers as a rather fabrication. Now, if we look at the actual research rather than fabricated numbers, let's look at four studies, and I've kind of, to be consistent, I've kind of uh, transitioned the research on these so that we're looking at a forgetting rate of 50%. How long does it take to forget 50% of what's learning? There's a study done at the University of Tennessee uh, just this year as a pharmacy course, and the rate of forgetting was 50% in about five months. And it didn't matter if it was a lecture course, the, the course was taught as a lecture, or more group discussion, the forgetting rate was about the same. If you look at uh, MIT, a study in MIT in 2009, the 50% rate was 60 months, much, much longer. There may be a reason for this. This was a, a, a research on a physics course, a freshman physics course, and what they remembered at the end, uh, at graduation time, for engineering students. So these were students who were actually using some of what they learned in that physics course, hopefully much of what they learned in that physics course much later. So the forgetting rate was much slower, right? If we look at a study at the University of Calgary and the University of Toronto, three months, 50 rate, 50% 50 rate, this was a nutrition course. That was actually the high number, that was actually the impressive number when the course was taught over a four week period. If all the information was taught in a single day, the forgetting rate went way up, almost double, meaning half the time, right? Month and a half, six weeks. The fourth study is at Oxford. Uh, this is a pediatric course, the core curriculum, and the forgetting rate was 50% in 12 months or one year. Okay, so one thing we can tell here is that the research is really inconclusive as to how long learning lasts. But I think for the most part, we can look at this and say, just for the sake of discussion, maybe we can talk about a 50% forgetting rate over the course of one year. It's probably a number that's not unreasonable. In fact, and for some of us, that may be actually really optimistic if our students are remembering half of what they've learned after one year. Okay. Now, why does this happen? Why is the forgetting rate so high? Well, part of it is because this is education, right? We think of uh, education as an assembly line model. It's kind of a, an old school idea. That's the program that we're in was designed kind of uh, in, the, in the old industrial age mindset. And that's an unfortunate way to look at education, and none of us sitting here probably want to look at education this way. The real trouble with this is that it focuses more on the system of learning rather than the students. And I think that's one of the, the real key problems with this, that's more focused on the system. And I think sometimes you and I slip into that as well. We perpetuate this, you and me, because in essence, this system worked for us. We like the system so much, we decide to spend our whole lives in the system. And so the system works for us. And for the most part, we teach the same way that we were taught which is how they were taught, which is how they were taught. And so we perpetuate the system. Even though we really don't want to, we find ourselves just doing it. So we need a different model for learning. I thought about looking at a model in terms of a rising tide. A rising tide lifts all boats. And when we're in our classrooms, we often are looking at our classroom full of students, and we're teaching, and we're hoping we're really hoping that as we disseminate this information, all the same information simultaneously to all the students, we're hoping that that moment lifts all students and that they will all rise equally. And sometimes, in some cases, it's really important that they pass certain standard, standards for their exams, be qualified or certified. And as a university, we want to know that they had a quality education. A rising tide lifts all boats, right? Except you and I know that that's not true that every student who walks into our classroom is at a different level when they walk in, that their rate of learning, their competency, the rate of retention is gonna be different for every student and when they walk out, even though they might pass a certain test, 
or exam or competency, they're all at different levels. So I think we need a different metaphor than the assembly line, a different metaphor than the rising tide. I want to think of a different metaphor because we need to introduce the other definition of education. It's not only the systematic instruction, but it is also an enlightening experience. And I would like to think that we all look at our students and say, this is what we want education to be for them. We want it to be an enlightening experience. We want them to feel uplifted and hopeful and insightful and excited. That's what we want education to be. So when I think of a, a metaphor for education, I think of a hot air balloon festival. Because in a hot air balloon festival, and you can look at the, 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 the image of it, everyone's at a different level. Everyone's rising at their own rate. Everyone's enjoying the view. It's an exciting view to be in a hot air balloon and see out and to see the other hot air balloons around you. There's something exciting about it. And what fuels that balloon is fire and heat, right? We get them fired up and going. I think this is a metaphor that I can get behind that works for me. So if we talk about a hot air balloon festival, let's move quickly to the 12th century, the Iroquois nation. These, the Iroquois were the, the, the Native Americans in my homeland back in Wisconsin in the Great Lakes region. The 12th century, they wrote what was called the Great Law of Peace. And part of the Great Law of Peace was a principle called the Seventh Generation Principle. Some of you may have heard of it. The idea behind the seventh generation principle is that this idea behind the seventh generation principle is that every decision that is made is made considering how that decision will affect not the next generation even, but seven generations into the future. It's a really long term view of how current and everyday decisions affect a thing. Okay, that's 175 to 200 years into the future. That's their principle. Now, I want to kind of use that as a, uh, a basis for what I call the seven-year deal. The seven-year deal is a principle-based teaching model that aims to maximize learning seven years from now. What if we thought about maximizing learning not for the final exam? Because you know what happens when that happens, right? They cram it in, get it in for the final, they finish the final, it's forgotten. And they move on to the next class. Learn a lot, forget a lot. Learn a lot, forget a lot, and it creates a fractured learning experience for our students. If instead, we all as faculty were aiming for a point beyond graduation and aiming to maximize the retention of learning at a point well beyond graduation, seven years from now, that learning then becomes more continuous and holistic as we go along, okay? Now, Tom hit a wall in my class because as we got talking, I said, you just cannot write a persuasive research document to the Utah State University to do something that they already do. There's no point in that. He says, well, you know what? The University of New Mexico, they don't allow guns on their campus. How about I write a letter to them or a research article addressed to them? Well, that's a better idea. But I said, why do you care about New Mexico? Do you know anybody there? No. Were you born there? Were you raised there? No. Why do you care about New Mexico? Because they don't allow guns. I said, what would, you, what would your response be if you were an administrator at that campus and you received a letter from an undergraduate at Utah State University arguing for guns on campus? And he said, you know, I probably would think, what is this kid from Utah caring about my campus for? What does it matter to him? And I said, that's exactly the response it would be. How effective is that article or that letter going to be? Not effective, he said. Right. So now what do you do? And so Tom's got a problem now. We're several weeks into class. He's just forged ahead on this research project. And now he's three or four weeks into class. What does he do? Okay, this is Tom's problem. Now, if we talk about the seven-year deal, I want to examine the elements of this deal. Okay, uh, there are, conveniently, seven elements to the seven-year deal. 
The first of the elements is that each student is a person. This is no news to you, I realize. And yet, we often step into our classroom and we think less about our students as individuals than about the class as a whole. We see the mass in front of us, don't we? And that makes it difficult to teach them as individuals. So part of knowing them as individuals, we've got to know names. I know that's really hard when you're in classes of 50, 80, 100, 500. But somehow we have got to see these students as individuals if we're going to encourage deep learning. That's the whole point of the seven-year deal is to encourage deep learning, learning that lasts seven years. We also have to recognize that as people, they are social creatures. And even though we are all about the brain work here, and we're all about the facts and the research and the data and the critical thinking, these students sitting in our classrooms are social creatures. And, learn, and research does show that learning in a social environment actually lasts longer than learning individually. This is why study groups work well. Uh, students learn from each other. So the first principle is remember that each student is a person. Then that starts to change things a little bit. The second principle is that learning is activated by emotion. Right? We remember those moments in our life where we felt intense emotion. And you know this, right? You remember those moments when you were delighted, scared, frustrated, angry, in love, right? We remember these moments of our life because that's how humans work. Emotion locks in memories. If we want our students to remember long term, we have to activate their emotions on some level. And that can be a really tricky thing to do, right? That can be a really tricky thing to do. But I think it's a, a key element to thinking about how are we teaching? How am I inviting my students to feel emotion? Okay, the third element of the seven-year deal. We have to give students ownership, right? Think about this for a minute. How does it feel when a student walks into a room? What's the first thing they hear? This is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to do it. And this is when you're going to do it. And by the way, this is my room when you walk in. I own the room. I own the computer and the projector. I own the board. Students have very little ownership in the traditional classroom. And you know as well as I do, especially those of you who have raised children, when you want to get somebody to do something, you have to give them ownership of it. You have to somehow give them the chance to care because if they don't own it, if they don't care, then it's not going to go. And it's certainly not going to be something they remember. Ownership is a key. Okay, now the fourth element here, we're going to kind of skip past really quick. The fourth element is instruction. We're going to come back to that in just a moment and talk about specifically how instruction can work. But the fifth element is that doing initiates learning. We've talked about this before. Active learning is the way to get a thing done. We are all about brain work at the university, but we need our bodies, right? We don't, we're not disembodied brains. Our brains are part of these kind of physical bodies we have, and we have to get them doing something for learning to really last. We can commit facts to memory, that's true. But for learning to last, right, we're thinking seven years, we actually have to be doing a thing, okay? That's the fifth element. We get to the sixth element, and we start talking about what is learning, what is that moment of learning? Learning is surprise. That moment of learning is surprise. If you're not surprised, you haven't learned a thing. You might be, have committed something to memory, a fact, an idea, but if you're not surprised, you didn't actually learn it. Discovery. It's why we're, we're faculty members. It's what we love about what we do. We love to research because we discover. And if our students don't have the opportunity to discover, if we say too much, if we explain too much, if we give them too much, then we've robbed them of the chance to discover and be surprised. The seventh element, when we talk about it, is that failure delivers triumph. 
We have to find a way to let our students fail. They have to fail. And this is the hard part, because in most of our courses, if they fail an assignment, it just kills their grade. And so what do students do? They are risk averse. They are reluctant, afraid, terrified to fail on even one thing, because then they're sunk. And those grades are so important, we know to students. Even though we know they're less important than they think they are, they're, to them, of supreme importance. We somehow have to not only allow failure, but encourage failure, because if students aren't failing on some level, at least occasionally, they're not trying hard enough. Right? You think of a, a skier coming down a mountain. If they're not falling down every once in a while, they're not pushing their speed. Right? They're not truly learning. Let's go back to instruction. Here's, here's the thing, that this, this is kind of the thing that finally got it for me, is that all these years, I've been thinking that instruction was me standing in front of the class, delivering information, asking students to do a thing, a paper, a test, then my job is to assess, education is done. I think it's the opposite. I think we have to ask students to do a thing and then the assessment becomes the instruction for the next step in that thing. Because until they've done a thing, we don't know what their needs are. We think we might know, but what we know, if we've been teaching very long, is what the needs are probably in the room as a whole. But that ignores principle number one, that each student is a person. We don't know what that individual's needs are until they've done a thing, and we assess it, and we can, in that moment, when they recognize where the shortcomings are, where the needs are, in that moment is when the teaching is effective. So, this is the seven-year deal. Now, the next time Tom came to class, but well, actually this is probably two or three weeks down the road now, he said, I've changed my topic. It's now halfway through the semester, got a brand new topic. What'd you change your topic to, Tom? Well, I'm going to write about how elementary schools should grow vegetable gardens. Really, we moved from gun control to vegetable gardens. That's great, right? I said, why do you care about this? He says, well, growing up, I, we grew a vegetable garden at home, and it was great. And right now, I'm, I'm really big into healthy eating. This matters to me, and I think our children could use more healthy food in their diets. And if we could have them raising vegetable gardens, that could be really great for their educational experience, and then we could use that food in the cafeteria for their meals, and it's a great win-win situation. I thought, well, this is a better approach than the guns on campus, especially since we have lots of elementary schools here. So I said, what school are you thinking about working with? Oh, you mean I should work with a school? Well, if you really want to know what they think already, you have to have talked to them, otherwise you won't know who you're writing to. You can't be persuasive if you don't know what's the mindset of the person you're writing to. Oh, right. How do I find a school? There's lots of schools. Go find one, right? Drive it, get in your car, open the phone book, talk to a family member or a friend. So we went away and said, okay, I'm going to try this and see what happens. That's the next step. Now, I want to take a few minutes and give you guys a chance to think about this. How could you apply the seven-year deal in some way in your courses? Okay, I want you to take two or three minutes, jot down some ideas, talk with a neighbor. How could this work for you? What would this change about your teaching if your aim becomes maximizing learning at a point seven years from now? How does that change what you do? Let's just take two or three, four minutes, talk amongst yourselves, and then we'll, we'll see what we found out. Okay? Go. Thanks, Trent. Oh, do you want to pass? That'd be great. Where are we at? Okay. Good.
Okay, good. This sounds like the juices are flowing a little bit. Ideas that you might share with the, the room. What ideas do you have? Here's a comment over here. We got a microphone coming over. In English 2010, I, I use uh, service learning to get students engaged, but this gives I kind of a generally vague idea that they'd be looking at something that interests them as they, do, as they work for a nonprofit and then write a problem solution essay. But service learning is a framework. great way. This gives me a framework. Yeah. For, uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. Well, thank you. The service learning is a great way, and I know. We, we do service, a number of us in English 2010 do service learning as a kind of a core element, and that is a great tool to engage a lot of these uh, principles. Other comments or thoughts? There's one in the back here. Uh, I'm just wondering, I'm guilty of some of the things that you said, and I, I, I err on the side of giving them too much for fear that they won't get important things. And I, I hate for my students to fail. So my biggest challenge and what I'd like to hear more of is how can you sort of design it into the system that students will fail somehow? What's a safe failure? And that's a great question. And I want to talk about what I did with my class this summer and how this worked in just a moment. I want, I want to talk about that. But let's hold on to that question. We're going to answer it, or at least start to answer it. Instead of giving students feedback at the end of an assignment or an exam, um, figure out a way to build in feedback along the way that allows the student to, to grow um, from and learn from his or her mistakes so that they don't just feel like, oh, well, I missed that, and then just, it just gets left there. Um, and I teach literature classes, Latin American literature classes, so what I like to do is assign, re well, I don't really assign, I, I, I give the students lots of options in terms of topics, so that's the ownership part where they can choose a topic that they're genuinely interested about. Um, and then the research project is an ongoing thing throughout the semester where they get a lot of feedback, but they have a lot of opportunity to adjust things so that they can see it as an opportunity and to grow and not as a judgment coming down hard at them at the very end. Good, yes, thank you. One more thought. Yeah, right here. So, oh, sorry. So, like, if I focus on a topic that I want to teach for two weeks or something like that, uh, just asking the students, what do you want to do with this topic? What do you want to learn? What, what do you want to accomplish with this project? And just seeing where that takes us. Yeah, good. These are all great ideas. And I, I don't have the answers for each one of your courses because each one of our courses is so different. This, that's why this is a principle-based learning model. You adapt these principles to your specific situations. Now, as we, as uh, Tom and I kind of worked through his project, well, maybe I ought to uh, talk a little bit about my class first before I kind of give the end of that story. In my class this summer, students own the room and design the assignments. I went in the first day, I said, there are no lectures in this class, there's no list of assignments, and there's no grades until the final grade. Thank you. Okay. They said, what? No lectures, no assignments, and no grades. What is this then? I said, you are here to study three concepts. That's what this course is for. Research, writing, and rhetoric. Right? Persuasion. It's your job as a student who cares about their education to drive your learning. And I am here not as a deliverer of information because you don't need me to be a deliverer of information. The information is everywhere. You need me as a guide, as a mentor. That's my job. You drive that learning, I'm here along with you, okay? So they own the room. I don't stand at the front of the room. I go and sit with them. They are in charge of the computer and the projector. They're in charge of the chalkboard. They're in charge of the class time. We have students who volunteer to take head of the class, and they kind of say, okay, here's what we're doing today. They design their own lectures or teaching experiences. 
okay? It's a, it's, a, it's a scary moment to walk into a room like that and say that, but now ownership is real for them. Okay, the second element I just wanted to highlight here is that they work in project teams and they initiate consults with me, okay? So they design their own research projects, they put together a research team, they say, here's how we're gonna do it, and periodically, they schedule time with me during class or after class during office hours, and we consult on their projects, on their learning, on their progress, okay? Feedback as we go along, right? It just keeps progressing, okay? And the final point I wanted to make was that uh, there are no graded assignments until the final grade, and we negotiate a final grade, me and each student negotiate a final grade, and we celebrate failures. And there were some big time failures over the course of the semester. In fact, Tom's an example of failure because he took a topic, he dove into it, spent a month, didn't go anywhere where he needed it to go. Tossed it, he started again. Because there was no grade until the final grade, he could do that. If I hadn't allowed for that, if I had a graded assignment all along and then he throws out all his work, now I'm in trouble. Now I don't know how to handle this. But we negotiated the grade at the end and so it worked out fine. Tom incidentally went and met with one of the local elementary schools. They were thrilled, just over the moon with his idea. They sat around a table and kept him there for two hours brainstorming ideas on how to make this work. I said to him, well, what are you guys gonna do over the summer? Well, they're gone. The students are gone. Teachers are gone. He says, my fraternity is gonna do it. We're gonna cover this during the summer. We need service projects for our fraternity anyway, and so now we've got integration between the community and campus. We've got a great project. He found out that there's no, gonna be no fresh vegetables in the cafeteria because the cafeteria, that's like a whole sacred sanctum for food, and you can't brisk bring in any old fresh vegetables, but they send home food baskets, especially on the weekends for low-income families. They're gonna pile fresh vegetables into the food baskets, okay? Because I allowed for failure, because I allowed Tom to own this, because, right, you can look at every single one of those seven principles, and that's what happened, and now he's got a great project. How long is that learning going to last for Tom? He will probably never forget this experience, especially as he progresses, they develop over this over the next couple of years, he won't forget this. And he will learn what it takes. And I said, but you don't need to write a persuasive article to this, to a letter to this school anymore because they're already wanting to do what you do. So what are you gonna do for this course? What products are you gonna produce for this course? He says, I'm gonna write grants so we can get the funding to do the garden. Now this just became real. All right, now this just became real. So this is the seven-year deal. And we can talk more details. I'm, of course, available afterwards to talk about this. But this is why this works, because students own their education. They need to run with this. And as students build, right, this is a little animation we put together to remind ourselves that this is about individuals, that this is about learning, that this is about achievement, okay? The seven-year deal. Thank you very much.